Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome here to another episode on the podcast of the Heart Warrior Project. I'm Yalis Fas, your host, and I am also a cardiac arrest survivor. On this podcast, I talk with fellow survivors and occasionally I also talk to cardiac health experts like we're doing here today in this episode. Now, in this episode, I had Dr. Sears on the show again. Uh, this is the second Q&A episode that I'm doing with him. Uh, the last one was about six months ago and I received so many positive replies uh, so many people, you know, thanking me and, of course, you know, mainly Dr. Sears for providing the insights uh, on mental health. Uh, so, yeah, it was really exciting for me uh, when Dr. Sears said that he was, uh, yeah, that he wanted to appear again on the show. Let me just share a short bio about Dr. Sears. Now, if you listen to the first episode, uh, that bio might be familiar, but if you didn't, uh, yeah, then this can be useful information to just know before we dive into the episode. All right, so here goes. Dr. Sears is a professor of the Departments of Psychology and Cardiovascular Sciences at East Carolina University. He also serves as Associate Director of the ECU Cardiology Fellowship. Dr. Sears is considered by many as the world authority on the psychological care and quality of life outcomes of patients with implantable cardioverter defibrillators, ICDs. I always have trouble saying that word. <laughs> um, he has published over 200 articles in medicine and psychology research literature and as well over 10,000 citations. In 2021, Expertscape.com named Dr. Sears one of the top 50 experts slash prolific authors in the world on ICDs over the last 10 years amongst the 27,847 authors on the Topic. Yeah, in short, Dr. Sears is someone with a lot of knowledge on the psychological care for people with an ICD and who survived the cardiac arrest. Uh, after, you know, listening to this episode, you want to learn even more about mental health, uh, ways to improve your mental health if you're a survivor or a co-survivor. Check out, of course, the first episode that I did with Dr. Sears, if you haven't already, because there we talk about so much more uh, that... Yeah, so many more important topics. One more thing. Thank you for everyone who sent in their question. It's because of you, uh, the people who send in a question, that I can do this Q&A episodes uh, and have cardiac health experts on the show uh, to do the uh, Q&A episodes with. So thank you for leaving your question. If you want to um, ask to the next cardiac health expert your question, then be, be sure to sign up to our newsletter. That's where I will make uh, an announcement when the next health expert is, well, when we have an, when I have another health expert uh, to come on the show soon. Uh, and with, with some information who the health expert is, of course, and a place for you to ask the question. So check the description to find uh, a link to the newsletter, or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash newsletter to find the same page. Okay, let's dive now into this Q&A episode with the one and only Dr. Sears. Dr. Sears, a warm welcome once again uh, to the podcast. It's amazing that you took time uh, to do this once again. My pleasure. I, I was uh, really happy with the opportunity to present last time and answer your questions. And, and I feel like uh, much credit to you. I, I think you really did get at some questions that typically are not asked of me mm. uh, on camera. And I think they um, tapped some of the unspoken kinds of questions and fears that many of our patients around the world face. Right. So this is tough, tough, uh, tough sledding sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. psychological issues with things that have to do with cardiac disease is not the easiest conversation. It's challenging and some people want to avoid it, but I think your courage to approach it and, uh, your connection to me of wanting to pursue this is, uh, you know, hats off to you. And I appreciate, what you're doing for the world of, of patients with heart disease and ICDs and, and um, the range of conditions that go with all this. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I mean, like last time, people send in a bunch of questions for this Q&A episode too. Uh, I filtered some out, right? Because there, there were a, a couple of questions that were basically the same. Uh, I'm going to ask them in a, in, in a second. I was just curious first to, 
just ask you, because the last Q&A episode we did was six months ago. Between then and now, has there been anything particular that you felt very excited about uh, around, you know, the uh, psychological care of ICD carriers or cardiac arrest? Has there been something? Oh, I, yeah, this is a great question. I have three or four studies that I would bring up and talk <laughs> uh -huh. about. Uh, I don't know how many you want to hear, but I think there's three or four that come immediately to mind that I think are exciting for us. Um, I'll start with the most recent and then go back from there. Uh, you know, in the last week, uh, one, of, one of my former postdocs, who's now a superstar psychologist, Adrian Kovacs, together with Babic Nazar, published data showing that, in fact, psychologists being added to an arrhythmia clinic was quite helpful. Um, that study just came out, I believe I have the reference right here. That study just came out in JAK Clinical Electrophysiology. It's called Improvement in Psychologic Symptoms After Enrollment in a Multidisciplinary Psychology Arrhythmia Clinic. The bottom line is that it makes sense. That psychologic care being present and available in a one-stop shop makes some sense. And it was really just a demonstration project, but it highlighted the value uh, of uh, unifying the patient experience. Yeah. So I think that's one exciting idea. I think another exciting idea that's come out is um, Dr. Lindsay Rossman at Chapel Hill, another one of my uh, uh, trainees who is now a professor at Chapel University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, showed that wearables, about 20% of people who had wearables with uh, atrial fibrillation and other kinds of things, 20% really got more anxious from wearing um, wearables. A wearable like I'm wearing here, like uh, something that tracks your health and sleep? Yes. Yep. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That there was More about of people who, you know, got a little bit tied up in it and it, it didn't mm. necessarily free them. It, it yes. almost worried them. Yeah. I think that's important as mm. we start to think about the patient experience about um, being in an arrhythmia clinic. Um, you know, I think another study is one we did that came out in, in um, early 2024 looking at the extravascular ICD. So another kind of ICD alternative for some patients um, using a different technique. It's very similar to the subcutaneous ICD, but in this case, the leads are actually tunneled underneath the sternum, and that gives the same kind of lead uh, non-venous approach to an ICD. And this device provides some anti-tac pacing, which the sub-Q the original sub-Q device does not give. So it's continuing innovation. You know, we're not arrived at the perfect device yet, but more options, more alternatives, more approaches, more innovation, I think should produce hope for our ICD patients because people are working on this, right? We're not, we're not, we didn't stop and say, well, we got a device. No, instead we're moving forward. And then I think yeah. the final thing that I think's happened since I saw you last is um, we're involved in a number of, of very large multi-million dollar trials around ICD patients looking at um, the, how powerful optimal medical therapy is now versus the ICD. That could it be the case that... What that, is that, sir? Well, it's a study that would look at patients who would get an ICD yeah. And then determine in a question that was asked 25 years ago, uh -huh. determine is it still the case that the defibrillator versus medications mm. is the odds on winner? Mm. And rather, maybe our meds have improved to such an extent that, that the margin between ICD patients and medications may not be quite as big as we thought. We don't know. That's why we do the study. Interesting. So that's one study that's coming, I and mean, it's a seven-year study, so you know, yeah. we're not going to race to any answers. But, and we have multiple ones like this, multiple large-scale studies where we're going to do more around risk stratification rather than just they need a defibrillator. That maybe where we're going to be is, let's see if we can optimize their medicine, evaluate their risk, so to find the high, medium, and low-risk patients, and then have some shared decision making about how is it that you understand your risk and how does your physician and medical team perceive the risk and then how do we make the, the next step? Yeah, yeah. I think previously we didn't really have good data on these things so we just simply said, hey, you have risk and we need to get you a defibrillator. 
That's mm. still likely the case. That's going to be the case. But we're going to start to challenge those assumptions. That's the news. So Interesting. nothing's changed. But the questions are being asked. And that's the best news. That's how we progress science. We, we challenge what we think we know for sure. Because nobody knows anything for sure. We, we use science to determine that. And it means everything to our patients. Because we don't just... We don't just follow the leader, we challenge the leader and we yes. challenge what's best. And that's how we take the best care of our patients. So that's a long answer, but there's, that's a, you know, that's all of that means, forget about any of the details, it just means we're going after it, right? Yes. We got some good stuff going. The scientific community, the medical community is, is got ICD patients and got patients with arrhythmias and patients with reduced ejection fractions and patients with preserved ejection fractions uh, and heart failure, that they're on our mind. Yep, We're going yep. for it. So I don't know. I Maybe that seems too enthusiastic. But I really do believe that this is what this is what synergizes and activates our field and produces hopefulness when you kind of go like, why do I have this thing? Well, because that's the best answer we have now. But we're going to keep on looking and we're going to keep on getting smarter. Um, as long as our patients are willing to collaborate with us and become parts of our research studies. I mean, that's how we get better. It may be annoying but it's how we get better. Thank you for sharing that. That's actually a great way to start uh, this Q&A episode. Uh, yeah, the feeling that we're advancing as a patient myself and that, you know, every year we're getting better at whatever, you know, medication, therapies is a great feeling for me. And I think for people listening now too uh, is a great feeling as well. So thank you, actually. That's great. Well, you know, it's interesting, Yellis, because... You know, when you think about psychologic risk in the heart arrhythmia clinic, young patients are probably the most at risk for having psychological distress. I mean, we have pretty strong data that being less than 50 years of age and dealing with the heart rhythm issue has more impact than it does on the 65 and older. Is that mainly because life changes? More for yeah, them. that's what we perceive. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly what our research has shown. I mean, we've demonstrated this many, many times. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, having said that, advances for people under 50, mm. they're the most likely to benefit. That's true. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so, the, so that's why I think when we think about research and we think about innovation and we think about this space, mm -hmm. while it's most distressing to be young, you're also most likely to benefit from the things we're, we're going we're gonna to innovate on. Totally. So, yep. look, it, it's not a, it, that doesn't bring back somebody who wants to drive a truck and now they say they won't let you. That doesn't bring back, you know, mm -hmm. some of the, the, the trauma experience. That's not what I'm suggesting. I'm just suggesting, hey, let's, yeah. let's sort some of the, let's sort some of the, the positive and negatives, if you will, the, yeah. the, the assets and liabilities, however you want to describe the pros and cons. Yep. Let's remember that our young patients are who are going to benefit, and we are innovating. I mean, ultimately, I want our patients to have three outcomes, to feel normal, mm -hmm. to feel normal just like everybody else your same age. You're going to have all the same stressors still. Mm -hmm. Feel yeah. normal, <laughs> yeah. feel safe, mm -hmm. and be active. Those are yeah. my goals over and over again. You know, feel normal, feel safe and be active so actually step into movement and activity and exertion and and to do that with normalcy a perception of safety and then a re-engagement in activity yeah well that would be amazing if we get uh, can get closer and closer to those uh, three things because uh, yeah for, for young people you're right yeah but like you said they will benefit uh, more from those new technologies uh and i'm you know mainly looking at that uh it's not ideal, like you said, to have a condition, a heart condition at this age, but uh, way off the pros and the cons. So, yeah. Um, let me start by uh, throwing a couple of Q&A, uh, well, a couple of questions that people sent in to you. Uh, I'm sure some of the research that you mentioned now uh, will come up again, uh, you know. <laughs> um, and let me start, uh, so let me first copy the question so you can also reads along uh, so there we go uh, so this is actually a first question from a person who um, who initially 
I just, I kind of cut some parts of the question off because his question was something that, well, all right. He listened to the first episode that you did after posting this question to me. And he said, uh, like, okay, you can scrap this question because I know the answer now from Dr. Sears. But there was another question in his question that I actually thought was a really good one. And that's the one that I'm going to, you know, uh, ask right. to you. So I'm going to read it out loud first for everyone listening. Uh, I'm okay. going to name, I'm not going to, I'm going to keep the name anonymous, but let's yeah, call the person John. Uh, hey, Elise, I have a question for your upcoming podcast with Dr. Sears. This, feely, uh, this feels really awkward to send to a stranger, but I suppose it's time to be vulnerable and, uh, and lean into it. I'm a 30-year-old male, uh, and it's been a year since I've had my ICD implanted. I'm finding that I have many insecurities now. Uh, I, wear, I wear shirts uh, when sleeping to hide my ICD. I avoid taking my shirt off around my wife and anyone else so she doesn't see it. I'm paranoid that she views me as less of a man because of my restrictions related to my underlying heart issues and worried that if she ever decides to have uh, to leave me that no woman in her right mind would find me attractive. My, my wife is, a faint, is faint, faintful, faithful, and while I know my thoughts are irrational, I can't escape, escape them. So um, I kind of made a, a, another question or, or a question out of that. Basically, what can someone do when they feel insecure around having an ICD? And I, I, I think that many or more young people might feel insecure around it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that may be old people because that's where you might expect them to have something. Uh, whereas young people, it might feel for them like, oh, there's something wrong with me. Yeah, this is a powerful question that has a lot of parts. Um... You know, think. I think first and foremost is the courage to ask this question and to to recognize perhaps their perceptions are affecting them in ways that they may not need to. So first off, I think the idea about having difficulty accepting change that the diagnosis, the device the scar, the medications, the clinic visits, the remote monitoring, these are all changes. And they're all changes that probably didn't ask for, uh, changes that you may not have anybody else as a model. I mean, you don't know, mm -hmm. you may not be somewhere where you don't know anybody else that's dealing with what you're dealing with. Right. So we start to get at the point you made earlier about why are young people dealing with so much more? Well, we just began that process, right? In addition, this question gets at one of the big changes that is consistently shown in the literature as one of the mechanisms why young people have more trouble, and that is body image um, or sort of appeal. Um, sex appeal is probably a little strong, but certainly body image, body acceptance, attractiveness. Uh, I think the f so here's what I would suggest in this situation. First, I'd acknowledge that there's been a lot of change. The second thing I would do is, is ask him to check out whether his perception has any root and reality. So he perceives himself as less attractive, less of a man. This is a common, very common response for both men and women mm -hmm. after having a heart issue. And yeah. It's the old story, uh, you know, I, I would often see executives who would have a heart attack and they were used to being the boss of a company. And so what they would start doing is firing all their doctors because they weren't happy with the doctor's performance, which means they couldn't take the condition away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So the, their coping strategy that they've always used, they just roll into that same strategy as a as a as a patient and then start firing people and saying you aren't very good and you need to do better and and that may be true i'm not suggesting it's not uh, might not be true but that person's not actually encountering the emotional component of what's happened they simply are trying to solve a problem instead of accept the emotional part of this right yeah so i think this person needs to also check out with their wife hey what do you what do you think about me these days? How do you think I'm doing? Yeah. How do, how do you think I've changed? And see what's there, because my guess is 
that she, that she I, I think it's she in this case, that she, she yeah. uh, may actually admire him yeah. for what he's been through. Yeah, and right. instead of seeing himself as weaker, she might see him as stronger. Mm-hmm. I mean, quite honestly, when you see someone go through a medical situation, it's pretty mm-hmm. common to say, I wonder how I would do if I had to deal with that. Yep. And when one of your loved ones goes through something and you can say, wow, man, they're pretty tough. I didn't know they had so much in them. Right. There's some stuff there that I didn't know they had. And, and you can admire them. Yes. People that you love, you can't wait to admire. Mm. Ooh, yeah. I mean, you're like bent toward trying to admire them because you love them. So things that might make you feel weaker, other people who already love you say, damn, you're cool. I mean, I'm glad I'm with you. You got something in you I didn't know you had. And sometimes tough events teach us that about the people we love. We learn who they are even deeper. And sometimes they suffer, sometimes they don't do well, but we still love them because their vulnerability was lovable in that case. So it's kind of silly, right? If they show up and they flex and they're super courageous, we love them for that. If they show up and they're, and they're terribly vulnerable, we love them because we want to help them. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe there's more room here to land than simply, mm. I'm not exactly who I used to be. Mm. My final point about this is, We teach our patients, particularly our young patients, to treat their scar as what's beautiful about them. So to transform what they think is a weakness to their strength. Now, that sounds a little silly, but it isn't. And here's why. Because the scar represents wisdom. The scar represents gratitude. The scar represents courage to accept the reality that you have. The scar means something. You know, there's an old country song not a couple years back about bruises or something like that. Bruises or scars mean something. They represent the wisdom of life. They represent the ways in which our experiences changed us. And when we have a scar, that scar remains as that happened to me. Yeah. I'm not, I might have been wounded, <laughs> but I'm, I'm healed. Mm. And I mean, I don't want to get too glib or philosophical here. But it's more the case like this is the psychology of living with heart disease. The transformation of what threatened you into something that made you stronger. It's the most important thing a single patient can do. Mm. Uh, see, this is why I love having you on the show. <laughs> that's good. All right. That's, well, I don't know. Powerful. I mean, I, I, my point is not to be a soundbite machine, but my point is this is the stuff of life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is why I love what I do. Mm. I mean, we're not talking about, you know, feeling sad about your cat being in the tree. We're talking about the meaningfulness of life. We're talking about this, the actual, actual substance of living and the substance of life. Yeah. And uh, this is something that I think your podcast brings out in me. I think it's your style, too, about you're somebody who's dealing with this stuff, too. You're not yep. some cold correspondent somewhere. Right. This is, you can sort that which works and that which feels like fluff quite quickly mm-hmm. yep. and i think that that's why i love this podcast because there's no room for nonsense here this is this is a critical opportunity to communicate about really important issues for me for you and for your audience yes yeah your scars represent wisdom that's actually a very that's very good yeah and gratitude and gratitude yeah. because you say look uh, i ha- everything got risk everything i have right has been on the line yeah. everything i have including my very existence and this is what i got for it and yes it could weaken you but it could also become something that you build out of and build from and become stronger because we all kind of take for granted our health we take for granted all of the substances of our life threat and risk frankly remind us that hey we're not guaranteed much of anything let's let's actually gra- let's have great gratitude about what we have today and without it being you know silly or pollyannish but really saying you know i savor what i have i uh, i love it i love my life and i love the people in it and i love what i get to do and to try to find some of that savoring um, those are actually principles savoring find some senses of awe you know, be in situations where, wow, I'm so glad to be here right now at this time. 
there's actually very interesting psychologic data about awe and savoring and gratitude and about how it does seem to change some of the physiology uh, at least temporarily of of stress and mood mm. okay to improve those yeah because i think what it does is it 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 certainly draws our attention to the upsides instead of what might be our natural response which would be neutral or negative and so it's an effortful reprioritization it's an effortful examination of of affect and ex effortful saying yeah okay you know life's not perfect but hey lots of aspects of my life are quite great i always tease about you know i love hot coffee right uh, i love hot coffee i love you know a hot shower i like um, you know, a cold glass of water. I don't know. For me, it's uh, maybe it's all these temperatures or something. But you know, I love a new outfit. You know, I yeah, love yeah. a new haircut. Right? I mean, whatever it is, everybody's got their own, got their own thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's silly, right? But but you know, take those things away, and I miss them. Yeah, for sure, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. silly. Would you say, out of any research that you're aware of, that more men or women? have insecurities around having an ICD placed in them? Because I could see more women might potentially uh, be insecure around it because like uh, the body image of women are yeah. in general more of a, a so, thing, right? Yeah. Not so, to forget men now, right? But uh, is there something on that? No, there is some there is some data on that. You know, generally the data has supported women having more body image issues. Mm -hmm. Those things are getting closer. We don't see that 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 um, signal quite as much from our data as we did before. You know, okay. 25 years ago, I've been doing this almost 30 years. Uh -huh. 25, 30 years ago, we pretty consistently showed a body image signal for women. Um, but I might step back a little bit from this question and say, you know, when you ask women versus men about stress, mood, um, any any sort of psychologic phenomena generally speaking women are much more sensitive and salient they will at least report it we yep. don't know if their difference if they truly have a difference or they're just more likely to report that's Men true. Are kind of flexing and posing yep. and kind of putting their best foot forward and so we don't quite know about the role of socialization of men versus women yep. um, but when you look at the icd literature women generally have more distress and generally report more body image disturbance. Um, but I can tell you that, interestingly, um, one of the most interesting things about my clinic here at East Carolina University and the East Carolina Heart Institute is about half of my patients are men. And you say, what's big about that? Well, men are quite less likely to seek psychological care. Yeah, for sure. Um, and so, so the fact that we could get closer to about 50% of our clinic being men um, means that uh, we're reaching them in different ways. I, I like to think we reach them because we're kind of no nonsense, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I'm not sitting here talking about stuff that seems silly. We're talking about, hey, what are you thinking about today? How did you think about your heart disease? How did you get reminded today? What triggers, what cues reminded you today about your heart condition and made you feel insecure, unsafe, anxious, made you sad, frustrated, unable to, to pop out of it. When we get to those kinds of things, then we're very focused on the adjustment to the heart disease. And that's really what my, my clinic and, and my, my, my clinical service focuses on is how do we help patients deal with heart disease? I mean, I think there are better psychologists to deal with being neurotic or being, you know, worrying about your your relationships and things like that. there's better people for that but i focus particularly on this idea of you know catastrophizing about about um, your condition being avoidant so pulling back from activities and not doing like you usually would do and being hyper vigilant it's like oh i had a pvc okay okay you know, oh, oh, let me get my Apple Watch. I got my heartbeat went up to 84 just now because I because I thought about that. It's like, okay, that's fine, that's fine. Right? That's not dangerous. And so helping our patients, what? Feel normal, feel safe, be active, over and over again. We're yeah. trying to get at those components. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So hats well, off um, this question. I know we went round yeah. and round about it, and it's fine. Um, I think this is important stuff.
Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, thank you, John, for for allowing me to still ask that that part of your question because I think it's a super important uh, that topic. Uh, let's move to another one, and this one is I'm just gonna copy it first. <clears throat> this one is from Jamie Bowden. Um, he is uh, well the first cardiac arrest survivor that I had on the show. So shout out to you, Jamie. He also helps me actually uh, organizing. Uh, some of the online meetups that we do here at the Heart Warrior Project. Um, <clears throat> let me ask. Uh, let me read the question. Hey Alice, I was thinking about a question. We meet so many people who are uh, SCA survivors that have no need for an ICD, uh, but feel they need one or think they should have had one put in. Is there any words of advice from the doctor to encourage those who don't have or have the need of one. I think sometimes those lines get blurred with some survivors in our community. Maybe this picks up a bit uh, on the research or some of the research that you were mentioning in the beginning. Um, sure yeah. What well, let me let me say first off, of course, some sudden cardiac arrests have reversible causes. And once we reverse that cause, then the risk is essentially back to normal. And so, um, you know, that's a fortunate outcome medically. Uh, we don't see that all the time. Secondly, remember that the ICD is, has a history, right? So it goes back to uh, the first implant in 1980, the uh, FDA approval in the United States by in 1985, and then clinical trials around 1996 being the first time that we start saying, okay, now we have the data to expand the use of this technology, about 1996, okay? So we have, what, a 28-year runway here. During that time, we just basically only knew what we knew, which was people with cardiac arrest need one of these devices. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay? And it's only as science progresses that we start to separate high and low and medium risk. And so when you look at somebody with a reversible cause, we start saying, oh, okay, well maybe they, based on 20, 20 plus years of experience, when we put some in people and you say, well, they didn't use it and they didn't need it, maybe they were low risk. But we weren't in a position in 1996 and going forward to to, to rank risk. We just yeah. we don't have that data. All we have is ejection fraction uh -huh. in general. Now we're getting better and better and more recent research. But I'm talking about go back 20, 25 years. And so the message we send to the medical community and the patient community is everybody needs a defibrillator that has this experience because we didn't know any better. Now we're moving toward being smarter and we're not gonna race to the defibrillator every time for every case in, in every way, but that's where we were. And so it takes time for, for our information and our confidence in that information and our ability to apply it to the single person in front of us to be fully realized. So I think the bottom line is this, getting confident after any cardiac event is a must do. If you are not confident then we need to do something. What will we do? Well, the first and foremost is talk with your medical team about what are your risks and what are your forecasts or prognosis? Should I be worried? And the answer in this case is probably gonna be no, you're safe. Oh, okay. If you, if you continue to have fears after that conversation, because you've already had that conversation, they said, just do whatever you want. Then the next thing you gotta do is engage something around, what are you unsure about? Most people, it's exertion. So there we need to engage cardiac rehab or physical therapy or a personal trainer or your medical team to kind of put together, cobble together a plan about how to return to activity in a stepwise manner so that you can do that safely and strongly. And then third, if you still don't feel confident, then we gotta talk about it some more. Right. And talking about it means getting some counseling about, you know, resuming life with confidence after this part of it. All three of those, I don't really want to put them in rank order. That's not really fair. I mean, I think different, they need to be a, a mosaic, you know, put these pieces together to put together a plan. I mean, my life's work's been trying to train cardiologists and, and healthcare facilities that the psychologic experience is both demanding and normal and expected. Right. So everybody needs a plan. Every patient needs a plan to resume life. You just simply can't work on people's hearts without recognizing you've inadvertently worked on their mind. 
That's true, yes. If you work on the heart, you've worked on the mind. Yep. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I feel uh, from the survivors that I know that don't have an ICD, that a reason why they still might feel, I don't know, not, not I don't know, not so good with that is because they're anxious that they might have another event, another cardiac arrest, right? And that, yeah, there's no parachute. Yeah, that's right. And and we are working closer uh, on this concept of fear of recurrence. This is actually a psychological concept that's common in cancer. Um, it's never really been studied in cardiology. A group of Australian researchers under a guy named Alan Jackson and others um, have begun working on um, fear of recurrence as a concept in cardiology. Um, it's excellent work. We're, we're, we, we have some similar work around fear of atrial fibrillation occurrence. But you see what's happening? Even back to this question, we told everybody everywhere, yeah, you probably ought to get a defibrillator. Now we're getting smarter. And now even psychology is getting smarter because before we were just looking for depressed and anxious people. Now we're saying, hmm, forget about just diagnosing people. Let's think about what are the common experiences that basically all patients face. So all patients face, what if this comes back? All patients face, well, how much can I do? Am I allowed to do what I want to do? These are so common that we need, a, we need a plan for every patient on these ideas, not just those who say I'm anxious. We, every patient needs communication about exertion, communication about fear of recurrence, communication about a number of issues. Um, and so, you know, we gotta get better. Your podcast is pushing some new topics and new ideas, and maybe somebody will hear this and, 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 and wanna work on this. You know, because we're we're certainly working on it, but we can't move fast enough. I can't. Uh, I wish I didn't need to sleep. I could get more stuff done. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that that would be amazing. Yeah, but uh, so, yeah, unfortunately, that's how life is. It it takes time, and and science evolves slowly. Uh, yeah. So yeah, but okay, we're getting smarter. That's 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 good. Maybe for so for I would like reassure that. this person using that stepped plan hmm. that that you know, they probably got the message that the defibrillator is the only way to be safe. And it is a yes. powerful way of being safe. But there are but there are other ways to be safe, including medications and clinic visits and follow up and and yes. diagnostic yes. testing. Those things should reassure when they look at your echo and everything looks good and they tell you that's important. Yes, that's yeah, that's true. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh let's move on to another question. Uh which I think this question is a really uh I mean, all of them so far have been good questions, but this one is really uh, good as well because we didn't talk about this in the uh, last episode uh, at, at all, I think. Uh, but this is from Doc, so a common friend of ours. And the question is, hey, Yelis, please ask Dr. Sears what kinds of psychological issues he sees with the spouses and family members of SEA survivors, especially those who witnessed the SEA and may have performed CPR on their loved ones. What kind of treatment does he recommend for them? And does he have any suggestions f uh, for how the survivor can help their loved ones address the trauma without opening the wounds of those memories? Yeah. Profound question as well. Yeah. Taking care or uh, providing CPR and witnessing a cardiac arrest in your loved one is horrific. It is a terrifying event. So many of our patients, particularly that's a full on code where the person's working and, and trying to save their loved one. That, that is outside the realm of typical human experience to save your loved one. And yep. that is actually part of the criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder. Mm. So, you know, it's reasonable to consider PTSD in that situation as a working diagnosis. And that needs to be talked about, dealt with uh, fully, because PTSD is very difficult to treat on your own. There are some self-help books out there that um, are possible, but but that is a profound, uh, life-threatening exposure that um, it can't just simply be waved off or or dismissed. Ironically, what I see clinically is that the patient who goes through the cardiac arrest has zero understanding and zero experience about what happened because they were out. Yep. <laughs> so now you have this massive distinction. This person, the spouse or loved one, had full-on 
exposure and experience to this horrific experience and the person on the other side of them had no yeah. recollection of it and that discrepancy is I, I can't think of anything else I see clinically than, the, than that that's just marked market it's so different but that actually can magnify the problem because exactly what it said in the note if the spouse talks about it too much are they are they traumatizing their their loved one I'd say probably not but their sensitivity to it is is understandable so I think that this does require uh, the opportunity to talk about it I think it it may require talking about it with a medical team to say did I do okay was this what was supposed to happen and kind of put some of the facts under control? I think the second part is to deal with some of the emotional components of PTSD that come along with trying to suppress the feelings. As you suppress the feelings associated with the trauma, they tend to come out in intrusive thoughts. They tend to come out in nightmares. They tend to come out in hyper arousability yep. and they come out in avoidance. Like, I don't want to talk about this. I'm just going to forget about it. And um, we see a lot of that, for example, in veterans where they're trying to just, I don't want to talk about my combat experience. I just don't want to talk about it. And fortunately, the VA um, here in the United States, our, our veterans medical system tries to provide them outlets to talk about these things because the human experience often does need to be validated to say what you're feeling is okay, it is normal, and it, is, it was horrific, objectively. That's horrific. Let's talk about that. And, and that validation, that opportunity to talk about it is often incredibly relieving mm -hmm. and provides people with um, feeling a little bit more emotional control, a little bit more normal, a little bit more safe from it happening in the future, and a little bit more about, okay, there is a future for me that doesn't involve constant re-experiencing of this trauma uh, every time I go to bed, every time I go to sleep, every time I go past where it happened, every time I see my loved one, that there is a day where I'll remember that it happened, but it won't be the, the injurious experience that it feels like today. Yeah. Uh, so my girlfriend is actually the person who performed CPR on me. Um, uh -huh. Right. I was asleep and uh, yeah, she noticed or heard that something was definitely going wrong. Uh, I would not say that she has PTSD or something. Uh, we talk quite good about this. Uh, but maybe for someone listening where, you know, the partner did perform CPR on them, but they might have some difficulty just talking about that. Is there some tip or some something that you can suggest for them to sort of start having that conversation a bit more? If they yeah. If they want that, right? But... Yeah, I, I think a professional is the right place to start, frankly, with this. I, I think any professional, mental health professional, would recognize how dramatic and traumatic this was. So to me, I think a professional conversation is a pretty good place to start. Mm -hmm. You know, I do think the, the, the patient, the partner, the, the victim, however you want to say it at this time, the survivor, sure, um, sure. that person is a person to talk about it. But I think even in this question, you see that there's a little bit of kid gloves, a little bit of self-protection of that loved one about like, you turned gray and it scared me. You know, you, 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 any of the things that happened during a cardiac arrest, that scared me. And, you know, they probably don't want to bring up every piece of that with you, although it's okay. I think you'd handle it. And I, and, uh, and I think most patients would handle it. I believe in ICD patients. I believe that you can and will handle whatever is thrown at you. I believe that in my soul. Mm -hmm. I don't think this is something that can't be handled. I think all of these things can be handled with the right help and support. And just in regard to your girlfriend and you, I mean, why, why could she do, why do I think she's doing well? And why do I think you're doing well? Because you're confronting the fears on a regular basis. You have a podcast for good. <laughs> yeah. You're talking about these. You're validating the human experience. Yeah. My new thing is, you know, how everybody goes, hey, I see you. I hear you. I see you. You know, that whole sort of meme or common yeah. phrase. What that means is that when I see you as an ICD patient, to, to put it into this context, it means that I'm validating your experience. That's the one of the antidotes to PTSD. 
is validating that the experience, I see what you went through. Right. I see it scared you, but I see that I'm here seeing you and I love you for that, man. So mm. I don't know, I'm kind of being silly, but the point is that you, you when you can validate what, what somebody else goes through, particularly someone you love, that is powerful. It is very human to need to be validated, to be seen as they say in this sort yeah. of popular use of the phrase. Yeah, and I, that's a good point. Like, uh, I feel like it's less of a big topic now because I talk so much about it like on this podcast. So I normalized that event way more. Uh, it's less of a, yeah, again, like a big thing that happened in my life because yeah, I've talked a lot about it with people and uh, in that way it became less scary, uh, less terrifying. Uh, yeah, all of those things. It's maybe this like uh, this is why it's a great podcast because you're yeah, doing, you're right. demonstrating the people you can. Mm. I just said I believe ICD patients can and and will successfully deal with this, and you just said I've dealt with it and successfully dealt with it. We're both sitting here validating right. each other and the experience for the person that's tuning in, going, "Man, I hate talking about this. I hate listening to this bald guy. Uh, you know, I understand <laughs> this stuff." but they're listening and that process is healing. Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking maybe like a surgeon, you know, operating someone, maybe in the beginning, you know, seeing blood might be like, oh, it's blood. But after, you know, a hundred and thousands of people and seeing it, it becomes less of a scary thing and you're like, oh, well, this is normal. So, yeah. Exactly. I mean, I think, you know, I think we're hardwired to not exactly love being around blood. Yeah, On the sure. other hand, approaching blood and being a part of of trying to heal someone requires blood sometimes mm -hmm. yep. the, the end game is good enough to to push through the discomfort yes totally totally yeah. hey i'm gonna interrupt the conversation here uh between me and dr sears for just a short moment if you want to support this project allow me to continue doing this uh and and we continue doing this i mean you know continue having podcast episodes with people like Dr. Sears, uh, do events, more events, then, well, donations are really, uh, really welcome. Uh, that allow that allows me to, to continue doing this. Uh, that allows this project to keep on living. In the description, I will place a link uh, to the page uh, where you can buy a virtual coffee for me on the platform Ko-fi. It's the same principle as leaving a donation, right? But on that page, you can also see where we are currently um, allocating the money that is, you know, earned from donations to. Uh, so you can see the you can directly see where the money is going. Right now, I'm actually raising some money uh, for a really big event that I'm doing here in Belgium with the Red Cross from Belgium. Um, on the 16th of, of October, it's World Restart a Heart Day. Uh, and on that day, I'm doing an event where, in short, it's a panel discussion with me, uh, my girlfriend who performed CPR on me, my cardiologist, and someone who works at uh, the... Um, the emergency line, mainly to just provide information, what is a cardiac arrest, the importance of CPR. And then it's followed by a free CPR training and how to use an AED, which, you know, that's what the Red Cross will do. So that's, for example, something that when you will leave a donation, that's an example of where the money will go to. Yeah, as little as two dollars or two euros, I mean, that really goes a long way. Uh, you have no idea. Because uh, right now I'm I'm funding that event myself, so some some help will be pretty awesome. Uh, and uh, yeah, you are directly helping uh, the awareness of what a cardiac arrest is. Uh, now, of course, you can also buy some of our merch, like the T-shirt that I'm wearing here. If you're a cardiac arrest survivor, uh, this is actually a very new design uh, that we got, uh, very simplistic with Heart Warrior on it. If you're a cardiac arrest survivor and you want to show the world what you are, a hard warrior, someone who keeps on fighting, then uh, we got some pretty awesome merch to check out. Like this t-shirt, we got it with different designs, we have a pullover. Uh, if you're a co-survivor or a, yeah, um, not a cardiac arrest survivor listening, uh, we also have free birthday cards. This is, well, this didn't exist uh, until now. I, I worked together with an illustrator to make this. 
Same principle as, you know, birthday cards, but then for the day that the cardiac arrest survivor died and came back. Pretty significant day for many survivors uh, that they either celebrate or at least take time to uh, reflect on what happened that day. And uh, yeah, you, you, you can now send them a re-birthday card to, to make that day even more special. Uh, yeah, we got some pretty funny and nice designs to check out. So that's also a possibility. In the description, I will place a link where you can or, you know, leave a donation or find our merch or boat. Um, or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash get involved to, say, uh, to find the same page. Okay, let's return back now to the Q&A episode with Dr. Sears. So in the previous Q&A episode, we did talk quite a bit about panic attacks. I, you provided some great insights and practical advice on that topic. So I will suggest, I mean, yeah, for people to check out that episode to learn even more about panic, panic attacks. Uh, but here... Uh, let me read this question from Connie. Hey, Alice, I'm new to this group, but I've loved your uh, YouTube videos. Thank you is not enough to say for validating that I was not the only survivor with my new fears and feelings. I would like to ask Dr. Sears if panic attacks episodes can be a result of uh, sudden cardiac arrest. Now, I added uh, a bit more to that question. Mainly, can you develop a panic attack because of, a, of surviving a cardiac arrest? Probably the answer is yes, um, but why does a cardiac arrest cause them? You know, what are the underlying thoughts and feelings that survivors have that can trigger and set off a panic attack? Well, this is one of the most challenging questions that cardiologists ask me to, to sort for a patient. Oh, okay. Because the symptoms of panic attack, which won't kill you or won't hurt you, yeah. feel like they will kill you or hurt you. Right. Yeah, yeah. Whereas the symptoms of cardiac arrest, yeah. Yeah. you may or may not experience. As you know, some yeah. people just pass out and have no experience of it. Yes. Whereas those uh, symptoms are dangerous. And so, for example, feeling like you're about to pass out is common in both conditions, cardiac arrest and uh, panic. So the overlap of symptoms is the confusing part. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. And we do see it all the time. Clinically, we do see it all the time. And I think it's because panic attack, from a thinking perspective, you know, if a panic attack is a physiologic, a psychologic, and behavioral phenomenon, mm -hmm. panic attacks uh, trigger people to avoid situations and afraid of being out. Panic attacks convince people that they're going to die, and they feel like they're going to die. And there's a physiology to panic attacks. There's an adrenaline rush that's going on. It is not all biologic. It is not all psychologic and it is not all behavioral. It is a syndrome of those three elements and a few more, some social ones and some other components, experience, learning history, whatnot. So uh, it is the case then that the experience of cardiac arrest, particularly symptoms that you can identify that came either before or after a panic attack, uh, um, sympt symptoms or experiences that came either before an antecedent, as we call it, or after a consequence, yeah. those are locked into your memory as a self-protective response. So you know, if you had salmon the day you had a cardiac arrest and you remember that the, the taste of the salmon or the, the feeling in your mouth or whatever, and you remember it as being tied close in time, yep. my guess is you would not enjoy salmon at the same rate you used to. Yeah, so you did some classical conditioning, basically. Exactly, yep. exactly. And so the classical conditioning is an important way we think about how triggers or cues for future anxiety, whether it be panic or, or general anxiety, how those things then trigger a full anxiety response as if you were about to go through a cardiac arrest again because they were tied that one time to threat. But the problem is that, the problem is that, I mean, salmon, as far as we know, is not pro-arrhythmic, right? We don't think that causes cardiac arrest. Sure. On the other hand, 
understanding that that was there that day. It's an innocent bystander, but yet it was there that day. So when you see that bystander again, it'll trigger that memory because that's a self-protective response that, that we have. So the reverse of this is to look for safety responses. So to say, well, I had salmon the other day and nothing happened. Mm -hmm. And I felt salmon the other day and it was fine. Yeah. Or whatever the cue is, right? And we're, we're playing out salmon, but whatever the cue sure, is. Sure, sure. Yeah. And I like to think about anxiety as an alarm system that is trying to protect us, but that the alarm system is overly active and overly react, uh, responded, responsive. And so, yeah, thank you for that message that triggers my anxiety, but I'm safe here. So thank you body for that cue, that reminder, that thought, that feeling, that symptom. Thank you. But I remember I'm okay. And, and my higher order thinking, if you will, can talk down my lower order thinking, which is the anxiety or simply say, thanks for the note. I'm not going to fight you. I'm not going to try to not be anxious. I'm going to say, okay, thanks, but I'm okay. I'm safe. So anxiety is a tricky one for all of those reasons. I'm given an hour long talk these days on the road about fear in electrophysiology and how fear spreads through a clinic, if you will, like a contagion. Yeah. And instead what we have to do is, is acknowledge the contagion and um, plan for it rather yeah, than yeah. try to stamp out anxiety in all ways, forms and shapes rather than say, okay, anxiety is a normal reaction to high stakes things, high stakes events, high stakes concerns. Yeah. Is there, I mean, because yeah, it's, yeah, the symptoms are so similar. Is there something that can distinguish though when you are experiencing uh, something from your heart, like a, right, like a cardiac health issue or, or something there compared to a panic attack or anxiety? Is there some, something that, yeah, uh, for people to know the difference when they're experiencing that? To know like, oh, now this is actually anxiety or now, oh, it's actually something maybe from my heart which I should take a bit more serious. Is there anything? Well, this is a sticky question because, yeah. I mean, basically dangerous heart rhythms are going to be super fast and super irregular. Yeah. Mm. So a, a panic attack, even at its full, um, would rarely, if ever, get up into a range that we would consider to be a dangerous heart rhythm. I mean, those, they're, so they, they're quite separate in terms of the, the numeric aspects of them. Even a fast heart rate because of anxiety generally is not going to be way out of bounds. And, you know, we don't think about the current data, the current meta-analysis that's available in the journal, um, General Hospital Psychiatry from last year showed that anxiety and depression do not cause shocks. So okay. They do not cause arrhythmias. Hmm. Anxiety and depression were associated with worse outcomes, not shocks, but worse outcomes in part because anxiety and depression, I think, we don't know. There's just a correlation, so you can't form causation. But that correlation, one guess about why it might be associated is that anxiety and depression trigger people to withdraw from activities, withdraw from life, withdraw from the things that need to be part of their recovery process, including even taking their meds potentially. All right. But I think we can stop walking on eggshells about our emotions. I just, I think that that's not helpful. How, emotions are, are the human experience. We can, we can address them by how we understand what's happening and, and our emotions often flow from our understanding. But I, I, I'd like for us to get past that we can't be anxious and depressed because we've had a heart issue. I'd rather us say anxiety and depression are common in all patients, all people and in heart patients and understandably so. Yeah. Gosh, let's be a little more self-compassionate about the emotional experience of things that are scary and just simply say, yeah, you got an alarm system that's built in from thousands of years and that alarm system at times will go off. And in, in this case, it goes off particularly around cardiac events and that can lead you to be panicky sometimes. So yeah. build, build a plan around, hey, I'm going to talk myself down. I'm going to check in with other people and make sure I'm okay and I'm going to get good medical care, and I'm going to reassure myself that, that 
um, I'm going to be okay. That doesn't mean disregard medical care. That doesn't mean any of those things. It means that in the presence of sufficient medical care, sufficient planning, that anxiety will come, anxiety will go. It's not dangerous, but it needs to be addressed. Yeah, and like you said, collecting that evidence from other moments where you were fine, even though that it happened. Like uh, yeah. that's yeah, evidence that probably it's going to be fine again, and you build up some confidence through that, hopefully. But uh, yeah. But you said it perfectly. So we're good at remembering um, what's called confirmation bias. Yeah. So mm. every time I smell salmon, I have a problem. Mm. Okay, but you forget the times you did smell right. salmon and didn't have a problem. You only focus on the time that it must have been that. And it's like, well, that's a uh, forming um, causation and a correlation. So that's probably not always going to work out for you. So I don't mean to undermine that anxiety is not important. It's my life's work. I'm trying to highlight that anxiety can be a part of your experience and still not ruin the day. Sure. Right. All right, uh, let's move to, let's see. Um, let's, let me just see. Uh, let's get one more quick. Yeah, let me ask one more question. Uh, by the way, again, for people listening, because we talked way more about panic, panic attacks and anxiety in, in the previous Q&A episode, so definitely check that episode out. Uh, let's ask the last question. It's a yeah, bit of a long text. Okay. Um, I was, so from Lor Lorraine, I was shocked 48 times in 30 minutes uh, after a catheter induced spiraling descending of the, these are a lot of terms that I actually don't know, <laughs> uh, yeah. descending of the LMLAD and first dike. So those diagonal. are coronary arteries that were dissected. Okay, thank you. Yeah, mm -hmm. so you, pro you probably can help me out with this. Uh, I was placed on... Uh, ECMO and received five, yeah, five inches of stents and hospitalized uh, 70 days. I did six months of CBT so I could revisit the CVICU. Mm -hmm. I have no re recollection of what happened during the event, um, but I still feel a huge amount of residual res uh, trauma, constriction yeah. from all the shocks. My question is, is whether, uh, whether hype not Hypnotherapy, oh, these are a lot of complicated words for me. <laughs> Hypnotherapy yeah. can be a via approach to relieve the actual event and aid in releasing the residual trauma and what the risks are of this approach. Um, I also added uh, another question to this because I remember that you recommended CBT as a therapy uh, in the previous yes. uh, Q&A episodes. But uh, besides CBT, are there any you know, somatic therapies that you know of that are uh, evidence-based therapies, right? That have good results for people dealing with trauma or PTSD after uh, surviving a, a cardiac arrest or living with an ICD. Yeah, well, let me respond to the person first. This is a profound set of, of adverse events. Uh, what occurred in this case is extremely uncommon and potentially dangerous. Um, so this is a this was a set of adverse events that hopefully uh, never happened to anyone. Um, they are part of the risks of what is done every day by cardiology. So these are known risks. However, we hope they never happen. But of course, like all risks, they, they occasionally do. So this is a very dramatic, very serious set of adverse events that is quite uncommon. This is very easily traumatic and understandably traumatic. And it sounds like they've done a nice job of getting into some therapy and trying to encounter the threats and fears that um, they experience by going back to the ICU and actually being there and saying, I can, in fact, experience this environment and weather the storm. That's a very powerful and courageous thing to do. Now, in terms of the question, so we've talked a lot about PTSD even in this episode and recur, recurrent thoughts of and, and intrusive thoughts about the events and the trauma. This was a profound trauma this person went through and, and probably will need continual supportive care from time to time to stamp out some of the 
and encounter and and tolerate some of the thoughts and feelings that come with this. so so therapy is gonna be something that can be useful over time. this is not a hey i did this and now i'm done. it's gonna be something where some of these memories and thoughts will kind of pop up again and they're worth addressing. the question has to do, so cognitive behavioral therapy is the one we have the most evidence for. we have multiple clinical trials that show that cognitive behavioral therapy helps ICD patients manage anxiety from multiple domains. done. now hypnotherapy we don't have any data for. i am not an expert in hypnotherapy and um, don't practice it and don't know very much about it. i'm aware of it but i don't know much about it. so I, i'm not really qualified to speak about hypnotherapy um, but i'm not aware of any data to support it in this area. there probably are some case studies within general uh, medical patients and there are people who feel strongly about it um, but i'm just not I'm not aware, and I'm generally, of what I am aware of, there are not the level of evidence that I would expect to be able to recommend something like that. Right. Yeah. So um, there's nothing, I don't feel strongly one way or the other, I just don't have any evidence about it. Mm -hmm. And so things without evidence, I generally shy away from because I'm an evidence-based practitioner. I, I use the scientific method to evaluate whether something would work or not work. Um, so, so I, I think it's worth this uh, person asking the question. I think it's worth continuing down the track of therapy, trusting in the people taking good care of you, and asking good questions. And and um, you know, I guess I would I would I would encourage this person to ask the person taking care of them about their thoughts about hypnotherapy, as I'm quite silent on the topic. And uh, besides hypnotherapy, is there any other somatic therapies uh, that do? Well, cardiac rehab you know, is my favorite, 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 because cardiac rehab provides people with the exposure to the threat. You know, if you think one of the fears that I see, they have many that we could talk about, but one of them is fear of exertion. And cardiac rehab allows a safe re-exposure to your heart beating faster and nothing bad happening. And they do that in a stepwise, overtime way. And that has massive psychologic benefit. So cardiac rehab is, is what I think is the poor man's psychotherapy, meaning that you don't probably have somebody in your area who does cardiac psychology. But if you have cardiac rehab, you can get a lot of the benefit of therapy via cardiac rehab. You also get people work exercising with you. You also get kind people asking you how you're doing and exposure to your heartbeat and then you get a little bit stronger and then you start planning a future and you start realizing i'm not just a victim here i can actually survive this and move on and that's a big benefit of cardiac rehab yeah it's a bit like exposure therapy then right it's exactly exposure oh, therapy yeah. talking sort of psychologic jargon yeah uh, that's what exactly what it is it's exposing people to one of the fears or a core fear of the cardiac event by the way uh maybe some specifics around this uh, if you could share like if someone would want to find a therapist or you know, well a psychologist right is there some other qualifications that you would recommend them to look for like uh like yeah. a clinical psychologist a health psychologist i don't yeah. know right yes is yes. there something yeah great question so <clears throat> psychology is a little bit confusing because yeah. Uh, there are many subtypes. I just looked at the data this morning. So um, the American Psychological Association reports that 12% of clinical psychologists are called clinical health psychologists. And in my view, that's what you want to look for. You want to look for a clinical psychologist, um, and it can be other, it could be a counseling psychologist, but a, but a health service psychologist who focuses on health, the health part. Um, because a clinical psychologist would be somebody you might go to for, um, you know, traditional marital problems or mm -hmm. uh, traditional depression, um, anxiety, changes in life, things like that. But a clinical health psychologist is going to be somebody trained in yeah. adjustment to medical problems, adjustment to health, or focus on promoting health and reducing the impact of disease. But as I said, only 12% of clinical psychologists are so-called health psychologists. And... So that's what I would look for. In the United States, you can go to the American Psychological Association and type in health psychologist referral 
on their therapy referral network and at least get some names. Um, around the world, um, in Europe and other places, I don't know what the uh, local psychological association has, but you could certainly search by um, health psychologist in your area and try to look for the training that would involve, you know, taking care of cancer patients, taking care of heart patients, taking care of family medicine patients, you know, common somatic problems that, that have, you know, difficulty in coping with them. And so those are really nice connections and give people a chance. And, and they, professionals ethically are, are asked to say, I don't know about that. I, I, I'm not the right person to take care of you because I don't know about that. In general, there are many, many things that are common across medical illnesses. And then a few very specific things around cardiac arrest and ICDs. But, but the vast majority of the things that a therapist might provide could be beneficial. Yes, yes, all right. Okay. All right, so those were all the questions uh, for the Q&A. So thank you so much for, you know, answering them. My pleasure. Uh, let me just end the, the, you know, the interview here. Is there anything more that you just want to share um, or uh, anything more that you want to, well, answer on from any questions that we covered or just in general? Is there some last words that you have? Yeah, I think... One major idea that gets left out a lot for everyone is self-compassion. To recognize that everybody's doing the best they can. And even people not doing that well are doing all they can do with the situation they're in. Self-compassion refers to giving yourself the benefit of the doubt about your processes and your efforts. And to be a little more encouraging to yourself, I mean, nobody would see someone struggling and say, you're such an idiot. Why do you struggle? But yet we say that to ourselves. And so I think self-compassion is one concept that's worth um, considering for all heart patients and just recognizing this is a process. Every day you move, you try to move in the right direction. Some days you may not make much progress, but every day is a day to move forward toward living fully and and to be tolerant of days that you don't and to be appreciative of days that you do mm. and so i would i would talk about self-compassion and i think even the questions that we looked at today yeah. each of them had s some element in which i could feel based on the question that they were really struggling and maybe being hard on themselves rather than simply saying hey man i'm a work in progress i'm not the person i want to be Today, uh, I'm working towards somebody I want to be, but every day I, I get a chance to move a little bit toward it and, and to be just tolerant of that process. So I, I stand on the idea that I admire the process of my patients. I admire what heart patients have to think their way through and act their way through. And as they do that, I think they learn so much about themselves and about the human spirit is is incredible. So that's why I do what I do. I love to see people get stronger from that which makes them what that which others think makes them weak. I like to see our patients become stronger from the threats and overcome them. It gets me up every day. Yeah. So, good stuff. Yeah, Dr. Sears, I mean really this was amazing to do again. So thank you uh, once again for, for taking the time and being here. You're the best you. in the business, my friend. <laughs> thank you. So are you. <laughs> All right. Okay, that concludes this episode with Dr. Sears. Like I said in the beginning, in the intro, if you uh, want to learn even more about mental health uh, for, you know, uh, people wearing an ICD or uh, who survived the cardiac arrest, check out the first Q&A episode that I did with Dr. Sears, uh, which I will place in the description of this episode. Or you can also go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash podcast and search for Dr. Sears to find the episode. Thank you. I mean, really, for everyone who is sending a question, it's because of you, you know, uh, that this Q&A episodes are a Q&A episode. So really, thank you. 
um, for sending in your question. If you want to send in a question to the next cardiac health expert that we will have on the show, then sign up to our newsletter as that's where I will make an announcement when um, there's going to be a new cardiac health expert. Um, and yeah, I will also put some extra information there about the cardiac health experts and a place where you can send in your question. If you're interested in that, then also check the description because you can find a link to the newsletter there or go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash newsletter to find the same page. Thank you for being here. And yeah, if you liked this episode, don't forget, of course, to subscribe. And uh, if you could take just a couple of seconds of your time to leave a rating and or a review about this podcast, that would truly help out uh, the Heart Warrior Project and to spread out, you know, episodes like this more into the world. So, yeah, thank you if you would do that. Now, with that, I hope that I get the chance to welcome you on another episode. But until then, this is your host, Elis Vaz, signing off. Bye, everyone. Oh, one more thing before you take off. Um, yeah, if you want to support this project, uh, there's a couple of ways that you can do that. And one way is by leaving a donation. Um, and yeah, that, that money will help me to fund this project, to continue doing this podcast, to uh, do more events, uh, and to just spread out more awareness around cardiac arrests. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can have a direct impact on that by leaving a small donation even as little as two dollars or two euros goes a long way to allow me to continue uh, running this project in the description i will put a link where you can find the ko-fi page which is where you can treat me on a virtual coffee now all the money that is donated i use that to fund this project and you can actually see in the ko-fi page uh what the current uh well, what the current goal is or what the current thing is that we are doing uh, and where we are asking some money for to fund it. Uh, right now, I'm actually doing a very big event with the Red Cross here in Belgium. 16 October, it's start uh, World Restart a Heart Day. And I am organizing, uh, again, a really big event with the Red Cross where, in short, it's going to be a panel discussion with me, my girlfriend, who did CPR on me, my cardiologist, and then someone who works at the emergency line to bring awareness around what a cardiac arrest is and the importance of CPR. And then followed, there is a free CPR and AED, you know, how to use an AED training uh, by the Red Cross. Uh, but it's stuff like that that I will use the money uh, for. So, yeah, if you want to help me in this mission to raise more awareness for cardiac arrest, then leaving a small donation is a great way to do that. So check the description uh, or go directly to heartwarriorproject.com slash get involved to find the same page. Of course, we have also merch like this t-shirt that I'm wearing here. Uh, with uh, This is a very new design that we have. Uh, very minimalistic, very simplistic with I'm, well, with just Heart Warrior on it. If you're a cardiac arrest survivor and you want to show the world what you are, a warrior, a hard warrior, someone who keeps on fighting, then, uh, yeah, we got some cool stuff for you, uh, some cool merch to check out. Uh, we also have mugs uh, for cardiac arrest survivors and for co-survivors, if you're a co-survivor listening, uh, this is also for cardiac arrest survivors, actually, but uh, I invented three birthday cards. Uh, together with an illustrator, I made a couple. Uh, we got now three different re-birthday cards, uh, the same principle as a birthday card, right? But then for the day that the cardiac arrest survivor died and came back, uh, many people celebrate it or take time at least that day to reflect uh, on what happened. And um, now you can gift them or send them a re-birthday card to acknowledge that special day. Thank you, if you will come to support the project. With that, that's all. Bye.